The CFA Level 1 curriculum underwent a makeover this year, which means you need a slightly different strategy. So in today's video, I'm going to go through a level overview, including the key changes and then some advice on how to smash it. Let's go. If you're new here, I'm Harris and I'm a very lucky man. I'm lucky because I work in investment banking and hold the CFA Charter, which means that hard work is behind me. But I know some of you are still doing it, so don't worry, I'm here to help. In today's video, I'm going to step through the strategy that helped me land a first time pass and 90th percentile score at level one. Let's go. Okay, let's start with a level overview. Now, CFA level one is unsurprisingly introductory in nature. It's designed to set the scene, it's pretty high level. And if you studied something like finance, accounting or economics at university, you'd likely have encountered some of these already. If you didn't, don't worry. This is a great place to start to establish the foundations. Okay, let's step through the changes in 2024 versus 2023. And there's three main ones. So topic weights, the transition to learning modules and the introduction of a practical skills module. So let's step through them one by one. Okay, in terms of topics, there has been a change in weights, but no change in the topics themselves. So I put the topics up on the screen alongside their weights. I'm not going to list them all, but let's highlight the key changes. So quant, econ, FSA and corporate issuers now comprise a smaller part of the curriculum whereas equity, fixed income, alternative investments and portfolio management are now larger, which is great and I'll touch on that in a second. Derivatives and ethics are broadly the same, so clearly there's been a shift towards more practical topics versus theoretical ones, which is a good thing because historically, one of the criticisms of the CFA was that it was too theoretical at times and not necessarily applicable in your day-to-day -day role. So focusing on these more practical modules is useful because these are actually applicable in your day-to-day -day role and comprise a much larger part of the level two and three curriculum, which means you'll be better prepared. The second change is that the curriculum has fully transitioned from readings to learning modules, which is a welcome development. So there's no fundamental difference in the content. It's just that readings historically could be pretty long and dense and weren't designed to get through in a single study session. Whereas learning modules are much shorter, digestible and designed to do exactly that. You can get through them in one study session. So it does mean that there are more learning modules at 93 versus readings at 73. But as I said, fundamentally, it's the same amount of material. Now, as I said, this is a welcome development because historically readings could be very long, which meant that you might have to stop partway through them if you were getting tired, which wasn't ideal. Whereas now learning modules should be short enough to do in one study session, which means mentally it feels better to just tick them off and keep moving. Now, as I said, broadly speaking, the curriculum will be about the same in terms of material. However, the components and the way it's presented have changed. Now, I'm not going to go through the changes in detail. I have included a PDF from 300 hours below, which highlights the key differences between the 2023 and 2024 curriculum. So if you're interested, have a look at that. But I will highlight a few of the key changes. So firstly, pre-reading material and core testable material has more clearly been split up. Only the latter is testable per se. However, the former, the pre-reading stuff is what's required for the more difficult questions. So this should help you focus your attention on the most testable material to begin with. And then if you have time slash interest, you can make sure you go through the pre-reading in more detail. They've also added a financial statement modeling component of FSA, which is definitely more practical and useful in real life. And finally, they have got rid of technical analysis, which was honestly so boring and pretty useless most of the time. So it's much more of a fundamental investing focus now. The final major change is the introduction of a practical skills module or a PSM. So all candidates are now required to do a PSM alongside the exam itself. So it's separate to that. It's almost like a coursework component. So the PSM will include videos, case studies, multiple choice questions, guided practice, etc. It takes around 10 to 15 hours to complete and is designed to help you build your practical skills. At level one, there's two PSMs, which are financial modeling and Python programming. Now, within their own right, these are both amazing. So it's up to you which one you take. They will definitely be very helpful in your career. But this is a great update. And there's other options at level two as well. OK, so that covers the key changes. Now, the level itself is actually quite simple. It's definitely the easiest level. And in theory, you can study this in as little as three months, although I wouldn't recommend that, but definitely within six months. Exam wise, there's 180 questions, no vignettes. So the questions are very direct and standalone. They're predominantly define, recall or single step calculations. So to be honest, the exam is pretty straightforward if you prepared well. So the question is, how do you prepare well? Well, I'll cover that in the next part of this video. Just a quick note to say, if you find this valuable, consider hitting like and subscribe. I'd appreciate that. And also, if there's anything else you'd like to see, drop a comment below. And finally, if you'd like to chat directly, there's a booking link below where you can book in and we can chat. OK, let's move on to the tips now. And here I'm going to share a ton of value. So the first tip is to use a prep provider. Now, I've said this in my other videos as well, and it still stands. The truth is the most difficult thing about the CFA is the sheer volume and the fact that you have to do it alongside work. 
So if you're going to do this, you need an effective strategy that cuts through the BS. So the first thing is don't use the books as your primary source of study. Honestly, it's going to take you forever. You won't know what's most testable. It's a huge wall of text that just stares at you. It's honestly so imposing. You're just going to hate your life. Instead, lean on experts. These guys see how the curriculum evolves year on year. They have the data. They know what's most testable. So they'll save you a ton of time incredibly valuable now you can use the curriculum or books for specific deep dives which is fine but use a prep provider first to focus your attention as ever i recommend mark meldrum he's highly credible his content is engaging and thorough and he's very affordable at 369 dollars or 37 dollars per section and that's in canadian dollars the second tip is buy your notes now this is related to the first tip which is you simply don't have time to waste and you certainly don't want to waste time on writing your notes you want to focus on learning and not writing so you need to drop this preconceived notion that writing your own notes is better for learning instead buy your notes annotate them where necessary and build out separate notes for the most complex material with the time and attention that you save you can actually focus on the lecture and pass through the curriculum relatively quickly then come back and drill deeper so to enable this i would highly recommend ift world's notes which are simply incredible they're concise well presented and focused on the most testable material so they save you a ton of time and honestly i can vouch for them i used them at all three levels and aced all three levels so they're roughly 90 percent synchronized with mark Meldrum's notes so that's good enough and you can annotate and plug the gaps on top of this i would highly recommend that you get the high yield package particularly at level one because one they have excellent review videos but more importantly the review notes in that are superb they apply the Pareto principle or the 80 20 rule and essentially focus your attention on the most testable material which almost always comes up in the exam. Also, for those of you who are cutting it fine and don't have time to go through the full curriculum, these notes are an excellent way to at least get a foundational understanding in every topic so you can go into the exam and stand a chance of passing. In terms of pricing, the notes cost $99 and the high yield package costs $145. Links to both are in the description below. And also, I've secured you an exclusive 10% discount if you use my name, Harris, at checkout. Again, code is on screen or in the description. The third tip is learn to use a calculator. Now it sounds silly, but the truth is you likely haven't used a financial calculator before because at school and uni, you probably use the scientific calculator such as the Casio. So although most of the functions are quite similar, actually there's some key distinctions and I'll step through them in a second. Now the CFA only allows the use of two brands of calculator. So the first one is Texas Instruments, which is the BA2 plus, and there's a basic and a pro version, which I put on the screen. And then there is the HP 12C, which I know absolutely nothing about. So naturally, I would recommend the text instrument calculators. Now, as I said, there is a basic and a pro. I actually bought both because one, you actually need two calculators just in case one packs up in the exam. They don't give you one. So you need to have a backup calculator because without it, the exam is going to be difficult. Also, the pro version does feel sturdy and does have some extra features. However, the time value of money keys, which I'll touch on in a second, are not a different color to the rest of the calculator which they are in the basic version, which some people prefer. So to be honest, the jury's out. I actually like the pro one a bit more, but some people feel like the keys are too sticky. And so they prefer the basic. It's up to you, the jury's out, as I said, have a look at some videos online and the links are in the description below if you'd like to check them out. Okay, here are a few things you want to nail. So firstly, set your calculator to nine decimal places and then use the memory function when you're doing calculations. This will ensure that you don't round too early and risk the final answer being one or two decimal points off which in the CFA exam is a fatal error. Also, this is much quicker than having to write down the steps of the calculation on paper or anything like that. So you don't want to waste time. I've put up the instructions on screen, but definitely do this. Secondly, use the backspace button to reverse errors in a calculation. Don't clear the whole calculation, that just wastes time. Definitely make sure you know how to clear memory because this can scupper calculations. You want to clear memory before you redo a calculation. Now you definitely need to know how to use the time value of money keys. These are critical, they save you tons of time. If you do these calculations manually, it will take forever. So make sure you learn this. It's a similar thing with the cash flow, MPV and IRR functions. I'm not going to go through them. Look them up, make sure you know how to use them. Again, they save tons of time. And finally, if you want to be really thorough, and I didn't actually end up using this too much, but the stat function can be used to help you calculate standard deviation, mean, variance, etc., much quicker than doing them manually. But you rarely have to do them in the exam. So it's more for practice, but it's worth learning if you want to be thorough. Okay, let's move on to the final tip, which is the suggested topic order. Now, there's two ways to think about this. One is topic weights, and the other is the use of topics and later topics. Now, ethics has the largest weight at 15 to 20%. So clearly it's important and you need to do well in it. However, it's not very intuitive. There's definitely something you want to study later in your schedule 
and then review and commit to short term memory just before the exam. They've even moved it from the start to the end of the curriculum for this very reason, I think, because historically people would study at the beginning because it was the first chapter and then they'd forget it by the end anyway. So do it later in your studies. So I'd recommend you start with quant, which is six to nine percent of the curriculum. And in particular, start with the time value of money concept. This is key. It's applied throughout the level and the entire charter. So it's very applicable in the asset class modules such as fixed income and equity and also in corporate issuers. The second half of quant is more focused on statistics, which is much tougher at times and arguably less applicable. So you can come back to this later if you feel like you're struggling to get through the curriculum. Then I would recommend you do financial statement analysis, which is 11 to 14% of the curriculum. So it's pretty big. And also a solid understanding of income statements, balance sheets and cash flows is critical. Then I would move on to the asset classes and start with fixed income, which is again, 11 to 14%. So a sizable chunk of the curriculum. And this applies the time value of money concept quite a lot. So you've just studied this, which will be helpful. And otherwise it's quite fun and interesting, although it can be difficult in places. So you want to give yourself time. Then do equity, which is 11 to 14% and alternative investments, which is seven to 10%. Both of them are very interesting. They're fun, just bang them out. I probably do derivatives next, which is five to 8%. It can be tricky in places, but understand this. This is designed to be introductory. You'll go into much more detail at level two and three and the questions in the exam tend not to be too difficult. Then do corporate issuers, which is six to nine percent. And this draws on a lot of what you learn in quant and FSA, and it's pretty straightforward. Then finish off with portfolio management, which is eight to 12 percent and is definitely the foundation of level two and three in particular. So do spend some time on this. And then econ, which is six to nine percent. And this can be very theoretical and complex at times, to be honest, maybe overly complex. So don't get too bogged down in some of the details, such as IS and LM curves and so on. Make sure you zoom out and understand it at more of a bird's eye view. OK, that's all the tips, some closing remarks, particularly for the exam. As I said, it's pretty straightforward. There's no vignettes. The questions are pretty direct, so you can bang them out, especially if you've done the mocks and lots of practice questions. Those are pretty representative. So do those. They'll definitely help. In the exam, don't linger on a question if you don't get it straight away. Just flag and move. Do everything you can, then come back. And that will ensure you do the vast majority of the questions. But that's it for this video. If you like this, then you're going to love these two on the screen. And otherwise, thanks for your time and see you in the next video.